The Secrets of Technology is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Technology. Hi, I'm Dom Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Technology, where we discuss the technology news that's important to you from a uniquely Catholic point of view. Joining me today on the panel are Thomas Sanerho. Hey, Thomas. Hey, Dom. And Jack Barazzini. Hey, Jack. Hey, Dom. Folks, I want to uh, tell you about another show on the StarQuest Network you are sure to enjoy called Let's Science. And you can find that wherever fine podcasts are found or at sqpn.com slash science. So over the past month or so, uh, first, Merry Christmas, everyone. It's still Christmas here. We're celebrating Christmas and (laughs) (laughs) all the way, at least to Epiphany. You can go further. Some some of us go even further than that, but at least to Epiphany. So uh, we over the past month, we've done our Christmas gift guides and those seem to be well received. And we got some feedback that I'd like to share. Uh, First feedback comes from Matt, Matthew, on on our Discord server, who wrote, I was listening to the hobbies episode. That's the one I did with Joanne and Father Corey. And two thoughts. For genealogy, I have used Family Search for it some. Definitely not as good as the paid sites, but it has started to get some military records and other records linked to it in the last couple of years. So it can be a starting point for someone who wants to dabble but doesn't want to lay out any money yet. Secondly, the radios, and he's referring to the uh, GSM radios that I recommended. Those can be handy, and you can spend as much as you like. In the past, we have used FM band, but recently, in the last year, some good friends of mine have got radios like Dom was talking about, but they have the added feature of bouncing the signal off cell towers when you're out of range. I think they told me they were licensed for the northern half of our state and have talked to each other a couple hundred miles away. Definitely useful for parts runs and harvest when around might be 80 or 100 miles one way. Uh, I should mention that Matthew is a farmer, so that's uh, where that comes in. Right. Um, <laughs> and when you have a, a vast acreage of farms, uh, you, you got having radios like that is useful. So, um, mm-hmm. so his that's tech conversations good. are so neat on the Discord too. Like just yes. listening yeah. to some of the tech that he uses. <laughs> yeah, well, in fact, we're going to have everybody's going to get to hear it because we're going to have Matthew on the show in a couple of weeks to talk about the tech he uses in agriculture and in in farming. And it's like you said, it's fascinating. I'm like, I, we got to get this guy on because it's really cool to hear about. So it's really nice. Um, But on the the things he recommended. So family search is a free nonprofit site. So you can do, you know, family trees and that sort of stuff there without paying anything. The other sites uh, do have costs associated with them. So, um, you know, there's some free levels and some things. So, but it might be a nice way to get started on family search. So that looks good. And um, yeah. And then the radios, so it's, it's, I, I, I tell you that they're, they're really handy, you know, when you're out hiking or whatever, it, it's, it's nice to have the, the radio, especially when you hand it to a kid who doesn't have a cell phone or you're out of cell phone range. So those are nice. And now our second feedback comes from John Henry, also on Discord, who commented on our EDC episode. EDC is an acronym for Everyday Carry. Uh, and he had a few comments and links. He says, uh, first, regarding Weird Al's Yankovic feelings about media piracy. Those have been public knowledge, he said, since he released Don't Download This Song. So, uh, and there's a, he has some links. and I'll try to get these links into the show notes, but he's only to where you can download that song <laughs> i got to see him perform that one live with my son as well so we, that, was, that was a blast nice was a good show. that's awesome uh he says librivox is amazing the app by book design had a paid 2.99 ad free version at least it does for android not sure about iphone um librivox uh gives you access to free um public domain audiobooks i think is what it was um mm-hmm. He says, uh, hard agree with Dom about the Leatherman Skeletool CX. That's the uh, the um, multi-tool that I recommended. Beautiful design, high quality, very useful, light, has a pocket belt clip, and feels good to use. And yes, even the pliers are comfortable to grip. 
Also agree on the Paracord Rosaries by Rugged Rosaries. They look good, feel good, won't fall apart. Carry it around in your pocket for years. Pray with it every day. And don't worry about having to always be reassembling it with little pliers. Oh, mm-hmm. I'm, I've done had to do that. Mm-hmm. Some of them use plastic beads. Some use metal. All are durable. There are also a couple of crucifixes that aren't welded together. And I've had the corpus come off a couple times. Other than that, they can take a real beating. For nutrition on the go, I carry Owen Nutrition Shakes. O-W-Y-N, vegan and free of major allergens with proteins and vitamins. For tea and coffee and cold drinks on the go that will hold their temperature for a long time. Clean Canteen makes really durable insulated cups with lids that can be twisted to prevent spills and stainless steel handles. Um, I have a clean canteen, by the way, for water that I use when I'm out hiking. It's really great. Uh, it it, it takes a beating. It's really great. So, and finally, if you're a caffeine addict and want an emergency stash of mints with 40 milligrams of caffeine in them, Viter Energy makes tiny, t- makes little tins you can carry around. The chocolate mint is my favorite flavor. Keep out of reach of children. <laughs> That's, that is a good <laughs> point. The, the last quick. one. <laughs> yeah. So, um, great. Thank you both for your feedback. We love the, to get the feedback on the shows. I'm glad that uh, I heard from a few people who were like, oh, I got some great ideas. And other people like, I guess I'll be shopping after Christmas and that sort of thing. So, <laughs> yep. very nice. Excellent. So, um, I think that does it for our feedback. Uh, let's get to our first segment. So, undoubtedly, many people, especially those who are listening to a tech podcast, have heard about this new thing, Chat GPT. And just to give you a little bit of uh, what what it is, um, ChatGPT is a variant of the GPT generative pre-training transformer language model developed by a foundation called OpenAI that's designed to generate human-like text in real-time chat environments. And that sentence was created by chat GPT when I asked it to describe itself <laughs> in a sentence. <laughs> so, uh, it, it, so, you know, people have been using it for all kinds of fun things lately, you know, uh, write me, uh, episode of star Trek in the Shakespearean style and all kinds of weird things like that. And this is sort of the, the text version of the AI art we were talking about months ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and some people have expressed concern about such thing, these these sorts of things, um, as well as some of the potential benefits of it. And I just thought I'd you know chat with you with you guys. Chat. Um, what do you think of Chat GPT so far? Have you played with it at all? Um, are you concerned? What do you think? I think it's. I think it's really cool. I think it has a lot of uses. I mean, I definitely can see how it can be abused, but that kind of goes with any new technology. And it's been interesting to see not only with text-based AI, but also especially with the image AI. A lot of artists have started this crusade against AI and talking about how it can never replace us and no one should be using it and it's stealing everything and this shouldn't be allowed. And my, my feelings on that are if your art is so bad that an AI can make better art than you, then you just need to... <laughs> become a better artist like this is similar to people talking about how movies were going to replace plays and Mm -hmm. you know or recorded music is going to replace people going to live music it's it's not going to like right it has its place right Right. like people thought photography replaced paintings you know that sort of thing right Mm -hmm. yeah i i think the the thing to remember about this is that this is really more like a google 2.0 than it is like an AI text generator. And um, I, I'll give the example of how we end up using it at work all the time. Uh, we are involved in many, many complex concepts and with a lot of different technologies at the work at, that I do right now. And sometimes we just don't know what they are. Like, like we don't have a good explanation of it. And then when you listen to some of the people that are working on it technically try and explain it, you just... <laughs> You just have no idea what's happening. So we'll just have chat GPT open in the window beside us and we'll ask, what is such and such technology? And rather than having to weed through a bunch of technical documents or find, you know, a, a uh, find a, a source that's directly related to the company trying to sell this thing, chat GPT just gives this natural language response to the question. And it gives us good information really quickly that we can use to then make actionable decisions on. And that's 
if you use it that way, it's a really good use of chat GPT. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wonder though, is if it's, if it's knowledge of things is highly dependent on what it's been trained on, because one of the things mm -hmm. I've heard people, you know, warn is it sounds very confident about things that it's getting wrong. So like, right. it, it, you know, <laughs> it, it, it's, there are areas where it's abilities are not as good as in other areas and understandings of things. Usually technology stuff, it knows really well, but more of the humanities type stuff, it's less capable with. And so that you can sometimes get a very confident description of a thing that is not, maybe not complete gibberish, but, but wrong in fundamental mm -hmm. ways. Uh, that's concerning. Yeah. It's been banned from stack overflow. Uh, stack overflow has already told people that if, if you use chat GPT to respond to questions, you will be kicked off the site completely, which is a big deal wow. for them. They don't, they don't tend to use the band hammer at all. So that's a, that's a huge issue. <laughs> Speaking of the tech angle, um, I saw this guy who basically used chat GPT to build a Linux operating system. He told it to become a Linux operating system and he was able to use all the Linux commands in it. And it was all terminal, but it functioned just like a machine. It was pretty interesting to see how quickly it can pick up that kind of stuff where, but things like that, it, it sounds really complicated, but once you kind of understand how it structured that's actually one of the easier things it can do like you mm -hmm. were saying dom like philosophical questions or more things that are not binary it's going to have a lot more trouble with. right so one of the, the uh stories i want to share on this was a, a teacher who shared his a personal experience on facebook with a student using it for plagiarism they were they, they were assigned an essay and the student used chat gpt to write the essay um so the essay question was write um write 500 words on hume and the paradox of horror so uh, a, a literary uh essay and he said that the the the, the essay was perfectly structured this is, looks just in fact almost too perfectly structured frankly uh i've noticed it, it really does the introductory sentence the three paragraphs in the middle you know the whole thing um so but he said it, it had a good sense of grammar and an understanding of how essays should be structured in my case the first indicator that i was dealing with ai is that despite the syntactic coherence of the essay it made no sense the essay <laughs> confidently and thoroughly described Hume's, Hume's views on the paradox of horror in a way that were thoroughly wrong. It did say some true things about Hume, and it knew what the paradox of horror was, but it was just BS, and after that, I substituted. <laughs> mm -hmm. To someone who didn't know what Hume would say about the paradox, it was perfectly readable, even compelling. To someone familiar with the material, it raised any number of flags. Uh, so this is a big deal because... If a student is using this to try to, well, even if they're not using it to plagiarize, but using it just to try to understand, they're going to get a bad understanding of what's mm -hmm. going on. And that was a, a, something that kind of struck me as a danger of tools like this at this point. Yeah, I think it's almost like um, Wikipedia had this problem for a long while where students would just use Wikipedia as a reference for uh you know, any kind of research they wanted to do. And what I always taught was Wikipedia is great to start, but mm -hmm. it's the place you start. You do not end at Wikipedia. And I think if you can, if you can think of chat GPT that way, it gives you that very, very precursor kind of overview. And then you need to question it. And, and it brings me to one of the, the other issues that the, that the teacher raises and that I've seen in, in a couple of places. It's that chat GPT is not citing its sources. And that would be very, very useful right? for links to be provided mm -hmm. with the answers that, that give a deeper dive or that give a more directed, uh, you know, place to go next after you've read the kind of brief overview that ChatGPT provides. I think a lot of this boils down to people putting too much confidence in a very early technology. Like this is a beta. Mm -hmm. It says when you open it up, this is a beta. This is not complete. And so it's kind of kind of on the student for trying to cheat like if you, if you cheat you're going to get caught eventually and this has been happening 
for forever. Like my my only issue is that I've seen this conversation lead to well AI is just bad and no one should use it, which is not really the approach people should be taking. It's a tool, it can be used well and it can be misused. Yeah, the, I mean, we've been kind of conditioned to think of AI as a potential enemy for a long time. I mean, movies have been telling us that the AI are going to take over and slaughter us uh, and, you know, and doing, you know, bad Shakespeare sonnets is the first step <laughs> or something along those lines. You know, it's, it, it is interesting. The, the guy who wrote this, the teacher wrote, you know, it's a neural network. It is not just, you know, scraping websites. It's putting a whole mess of data together and which becomes a soup. And so it may, which makes it hard to cite sources because it sources mm -hmm. all of the stuff that it's ever, ever seen. Um, but he also says it's going to get better. And that's one of the things that, that is kind of interesting and maybe scary depending how you look at it. But in a month, it's going to be better, especially with all the people using it now and in mm -hmm. six months. And and that made me think, you know, are we at this inflection point? Are we at the preparing for the great leap, the great leap forward of AI, you know, with all of these models coming out, whether it's the art models or this. And I'm sure there's some others. There's probably a music one on the, on the way with all this stuff coming out where I feel like as these things improve and they're going to improve rapidly, we're probably going to experience this great movement forward in technology with the capabilities of these different products in ways that the average person will see. You know, I mean, I know for years, researchers have been really hitting these things, but I think it's finally going to hit the street. And just like this, people are going to start using it, I think. Yeah, and I think the, the, the cautionary portion of it is do not become too reliant on any of these things, right? And that's it, it's the same thing with cell phones. Like cell phones are great. They're incredibly useful. Um, smartphones are wonderful. Uh, they're, they really help us. But as humans, we have to remove ourselves from them occasionally to be our own masters in a way. Right. I asked chat gpt by the way to tell me of its dangers and so uh it it gave me a list and uh <laughs> so it says one of the main dangers is that it can be used to generate realistic sounding spam or phishing messages that can trick people into divulging sensitive information frankly one of the key tools in avoiding getting tricked by spam and phishing attempts these days is just the terrible grammar <laughs> and the really mm -hmm. bad writing well that's going to go away uh, with with this and that's going to be harder to overcome um and likewise it'll chat gpt could be used to produce fake news or propaganda that's very persuasive and realistic sounding uh can be used to harass or bully individuals by generating threatening or offensive messages that are difficult to distinguish from human generated content um especially sometimes they can track uh such messages back to the originators based on uh, the language that's used, but if you're mm -hmm. using an AI to generate it, you know, if you know, maybe the AI can keep a log. the The chat bot can keep a log of who created generated what with an IP address. That might be a useful thing for law enforcement. But again, this is a danger. Um, and it goes on through things like impersonation, um, automated online harassment of people. There's all kinds of ways this sort of stuff could be abused i i noticed it didn't come up with things like plagiarism or uh one of the things i'm afraid of is and I, this came up once before in one of our discussions um ai generated books that flood the market like there's already lots of mm. really bad books <laughs> being written by human beings on amazon you know the kindle store stuff like that but can you imagine people basically flooding online bookstores with cheap, like pulpy auto-generated books with auto-generated art and just, just trying to, you know, make money by sheer volume. Uh, it's, it's a kind of, I think that it's not a, it's, it's not an apocalypse, but we have to develop the tools to help us with the, with these things, I think. 
Yeah, definitely. I did actually ask ChatGPT what it thought about using it for plagiarism, and it was not for it. And one of the things that it pointed out actually was that even if you get away with it, you're not actually learning the material, so you're going to be hurting yourself in the end, which is which is very true. Like anybody who wants to can find the right tools to get around actually bettering themselves, but at the end of the day, they're going to be hurting themselves. Right. Mm-hmm. And you know, and to be clear, cheating is wrong. <laughs> it's immoral. And kids, if you cheat, go to confess confess it. Uh, and you should also feel bad about it. <laughs> so so don't do it. Uh, yeah. So one of the th- things, um, so where's the money in this? That's the big question, right? Where's the money in chat GPT? There's an article from Reuters that talks about how the owner of chat GPT is this group called open AI. And they are a research or research organization co-founded by Elon Musk and uh, an investor named Sam Altman, uh, which also has money put in by Microsoft. They're expecting it to be a billion dollar revenue business by 2024. That's a year away. <laughs> what do mm-hmm. you think is go is the big business model for something like this for this chat AI? I think advertising is going to be a big one. Um, and honestly, clickbait articles. Those already sound like they're written by Oof. an AI. And you know that all those churned out garbage articles are going to be just run through a machine like this. That's interesting. Well, you can even write the website for you, too. You just ask it to write, a, write an HTML page that says these following things and it'll do it. <laughs> so. Yeah. It is fascinating. I mean, there are already uh, startups out there that are that'll generate copy for for ads or for websites, mm-hmm. you know, just auto generated from your company's documents or whatever stuff you feed it. I could see it doing that. Say, hey, you know, we need a we need a website quick. We don't want to have to hire a writer. Just you know, fill it with. Uh, instead of fill it with boilerplate that doesn't say anything here, fill it with information about our company over the past 10 years. And uh, mm-hmm. by the way, generate a video too. you know, make it, make it me a video that has a, a talking head describing all this stuff about us. I mean, it's kind of funny when you think about it because these, the, oftentimes these websites feel like somebody just <laughs> dumped a bunch of text mm-hmm. and, and stock video on the, on the, the website. So um yeah, that that's a, I think I think that's a big part of it. They'll be selling it to others like that. Um, I I think there's also probably going to be a subscription model too because yeah. I I know that for me I would I would pay money to subscribe to it just because of how useful it has been in shortcutting the the Google searching that I have to do to get a good tech article. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and and like I said, we don't stop there. So, you know, we'll have it write scripts for us too sometimes where we just need to uh, write me a script to do X, Y, Z thing. And then we'll look at the script and we know the script well enough to know, okay, well, you got this wrong and you got that wrong, but it gives you a good boilerplate code to just kind of switch out a couple of things and fix it right. to write enough. <laughs> you mean like, like a programming script, like Java or right, like a programming or script. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like yeah. a, like a shell script for doing something inside of Linux or something like that. And it's, and it's good enough, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not perfect. And so I, I would never rely on it to do something for me a hundred percent, but it, it gets the process started so that I don't have to, you know, do the from a blank page writing this thing. Right. <laughs> and then um, we also had it develop documentation for one of the things we did. So we made a, a Google plugin to alter a URL button and then had it write documentation about how to install a Google plugin. <laughs> <laughs> and so then we was like, hey, here's here's this Google plugin that does this thing that everybody's having to spend so much time every day doing. <laughs> I saw someone right. had used it to they, they wanted a, a recipe like a, a tomato soup recipe. And, it, you know, give me a, a recipe to make tomato soup with these ingredients that they had on hand. And they, they made it. They didn't die. <laughs> <laughs> they said no. it was actually pretty good, which because because there's some science in that. I mean, that there's some logic and science in and that sort of thing. So that, that doesn't surprise me, actually, uh, th- that sort of thing. Was that Tom Paris's uh, ancestor? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, it's I feel like it's the, the this, this conversation we had about AI art. It there mm. are dangers. There are potential problems. Um, we don't want it to. We don't want it to p- replace people and replace people's jobs per se. 
um, you know, we, we don't want AI art to put graphic designers out of business, you know, out of, out of work. But the fact is that the, at this point, that's not a danger. The, none of mm-hmm. these things are good enough to, to really replace them. It's really, we should be concerned about when they get better. Uh, that's really the concern. And, you know, if it's used as a way to get, to, to allow more people to be more creative, you know, because they don't necessarily have the skills or talent or the money to hire someone with skills and talent. I think that's good. Uh, you know, I think of the revolution in photography, you know, there was a time when only those who had the money to afford good cameras could take really nice pictures that could be used for things or video or anything like that. Now we all have one. I mean, if you can, if you can afford a smartphone, you can take great photos and the distinguisher is not the technology anymore. It's the eye and the experience and the mm-hmm. and understanding. Mm-hmm. And I kind of hope that this is what this is. This is just a technology that enables people who wouldn't otherwise be able to do these things to do them. Uh, yeah. That's the thing we really need to be making sure it happens with, with the, these sorts of tech. I, I thought of a really good use for um, like the, the mid journey type thing the other day that's that fits with that model where you if you're a concept artist that's where i think there's a lot of danger and a lot of people are worried about this but if you want to use midjourney as a tool it's a great iterative process because you as an artist you know styles that would fit particular needs of the people that you're doing concept art for you know the names of the artists that made them you know how to word things to get the right perspective and the right stuff designed so learn how to use midjourney as a tool to to shortcut that process of iterating on designs give them 10 20 pictures from mid journey that you think would fit their uh stated goals say which one of these do you like the most and then then you have a better process of being able to understand what they're looking for and you mm-hmm. can go and work off of that and make a really good piece of concept art that actually fits right. what their uh design is something else that has been fun um with the AIR is taking descriptions of locations or like spaceships from sci-fi novels or characters in books and putting those in and seeing what mm-hmm. it can come up with. Interesting. Yeah. I've had some fun. I've used it to develop some, uh, the, the mid journey art, uh, bot to develop some cover art for some of our podcast episodes of various podcasts. Um, and some of it is, <laughs> was kind of wacky you know it's not really good at hands yet like (laughs) people's hands just like regular human artists it's hard um and eyes even have been a little weird at times although it's getting better you can see it getting better uh with that stuff but um yeah i've you know in the past i've subscribed to uh, in fact we still do as a podcast network uh stock photo sites for for this sort of thing but what happens is with a lot of stock photo sites they create the same like the same photos all the photographers if you want a photo of a family (laughs) eating dinner it will always be a family mother father almost always two kids boy girl a roast chicken and corn and mashed potatoes and if you don't believe me go to a stock photo site and look look up you know family having dinner (laughs) and so it's like i want something different it's the same thing everyone else has and you can use these sites to make something new and so maybe this will push humans making this stuff to be a you know a little better than the ai can be Mm -hmm. so more creative more personalized right like um yep not not just what would a family having dinner look like but what would a family that I know having dinner look like? And that would be very different in my house than, right. than a, <laughs> for people sitting around a table. That is not what happens. <laughs> that is not what happens in my house either. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by chat GPT and, and I, I haven't done a lot with it. I don't, I don't know what to ask it. I don't, I don't have any particular need. I like the idea of using it as a way to get a, brief explanation of complex subjects, like sort of boil them down. I may try to do some more of that. Um, if, if folks listening have things that they've used it for, I would love to, to hear your examples. And, um, and if you found good uses for it, I would, I would love to hear that because um, this is going to only become more popular, not less. And this sort of thing is going to become more part of our lives. Uh, And maybe someday they'll encase these things inside of robot bodies and we'll have actual droids like Star Wars uh, (laughs) running around helping us. That would be kind of fun. 
Be awesome. So, all right. I think that does it for this topic. Before we move on to our other headlines, I want to first take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of technology, including Pat S, John N, Mary R, Michael P, and Michael H. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the secrets of technology and all the shows at StarQuest. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. So a Big bit of news lately, uh, a company that we've talked about a lot here on the show, uh, LastPass, they're a password management company. So they're one of the two big ones that I always recommend, either LastPass or 1Password. Well, LastPass had this problem earlier this year. They revealed that hackers had stolen some uh, customer data. So they the, the way LastPass works is that you're – and and in one password, you have a vault that contains your usernames and passwords that's locked with the password that you have, uh, but it's stored on LastPass's servers in the cloud so that you can access it from your phone, your computer, wherever you are. Well, it turns out that uh, the hackers were able to steal customer vault data from the cloud storage uh, in LastPass. But the important thing to remember is the the data was still encrypted, which means unless they had the user's password or were able to brute force it, which if it's a secure password is virtually impossible, the data inside the vault is safe. Nevertheless, this, this is a really bad thing for this data mm-hmm. to get to, to even just be accessed by a hacker. Uh, so what do you all think of this? Is this a... Uh, Alarm bells, you know, abandoned ship sort of thing for LastPass or um, par for the course? What do you think? Did they handle it well? I think they did the best they could with the situation they had. I I really think at the end of the day, though, this highlights the fact that we're going to end up going towards a passwordless world. You're going to need to have your encryption keys and two-factor authentication and multi-factor authentication and everything like mm-hmm. that. Like at this point, a text password, even if it's in a password locker, is still going to be susceptible to being found out. Definitely. Right. Like the new, yeah. uh, what do they call it? The passkey system that they're developing. I forget if it's called passkey. It's something like that where it uses, basically you have a phone, essentially it was like what it is that you, that has the um, bio encryption, your face, your fingerprint. Mm-hmm. And it stores the keys to unlock everything, mm-hmm. and so it's not a it's 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 never in the cloud. It's on your device. Yeah, I'm honestly surprised it took this long. I, I yeah. really am genuinely like LastPass. It, 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 this is more a testament to how good they have been than than it is like a, a failure on their part because this is a very very sophisticated attack. Not only did this person have access to their system to be able to get the encrypted information. But they also had they had to get access to that information from another system. So there was there's an air gap between these encrypted passwords and, and the storage locker and the actual passwords that could have gotten into them. And apparently whoever this is managed to get access to both of those things. It's an incredibly sophisticated attack. Um that, and and you knew it, you knew it had to happen it because it's such a huge company with incredibly valuable data, right? And they've been done everything they can to protect themselves, and it was just a matter of time before this happened. Uh, to their credit, they had as much security as they possibly could have. There maybe are a couple of spots where you're looking at it now, going, "Yeah, it probably would have been a good idea to make sure that you had that encrypted as well." But it was probably an ease of use thing on their part to you know like keep the URLs uh, open text, for example. Uh, so, so now a metadata attack could look at, if you could figure out who a particular user is, you might know all of the accounts that they have. And so, uh, you know, you know, they have an account at Google, you know, they have an account on Apple TV, you know, they have an account at Disney plus, and you can try and hack each one of those individually, or you can try and hack their master password. Right. And then you know where to go to use their password down the line. Right. That's the key is, is that they, they, they can tell what websites you have accounts at but they don't have the password for those accounts unless they've right. decrypted it mm-hmm. well and it also highlights the the absolute importance of you having a good master password for mm-hmm. your your vault um you have like 
in the past, it might some people may have been a little complacent, like, oh, you know, no one's ever going to, you know, get a hold of my vault, so I can just use a... No, you. what you've done is you've secured everything, these great passwords that have been auto-generated for you behind this door and then lock the door with a, you know, skeleton key. You know, no, no, you need a really mm-hmm. good key. That's the best, that should be the best key. Um, and so you really should have, a, you know, use the best practices to, to have a really good password. And since you only have to remember that one password, make it's it a good really one. It's really not that bad. Yeah, <laughs> make it a good one. It's really not that bad to remember one. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. And there are ways to develop a, a, a system of password that you don't even, you know, that is safe but easy to remember. Um, we've talked about that in the past. So, um, so it, it's a big deal in the sense of for, as a cybersecurity thing, but it's for, for, if I'm a user of LastPass, I don't need to be super worried. Right. Is that our bottom line? It, yes. It's tough. <laughs> it's hard to say because, because essentially what they walked away with was a box, was a sandbox to play in. And so they now have this uh, data encrypted yes but all they have to do is brute force it on their own machine and there's no protection to how many times they can brute force it or you know so, so they just have this data to be able to try and hack into and so if in the past you if you are a last pass user who did use an insecure password that like password one two three for your last pass login because you were like oh this is never going to get into anybody's hands i don't need to worry about it i would recommend changing every single password that last pass generated for you like right. generate a new one make a secure password for yourself because the likelihood that you're going to get hacked is very high it just and, is and changing your one your your master password now is too late because they already have your data right. somewhere else Right. So Correct. that that doesn't change that. OK, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, yeah. I mean, at least like at least change the passwords for important places like your email, your bank, all that other stuff. You know, mm-hmm. your password to your local newspaper's website, maybe not as important, but but yeah, while you're at it, you may as well change as many of them as you can. Is that that might be the thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I would be suspicious of any any uh, emails coming from your accounts for the next few months, probably. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Yes. If you get a, a message, uh, you would asked to change your password and you hadn't yet gotten around to it. Yeah. Be suspicious of that. All right. So our next story is uh, TikTok has been banned on government devices under a new spending bill passed by Congress, the omnibus spending bill that uh, has been all over the, the news lately. But uh, it included this this provision that any federal devices, fed, you know, phones, usually it means phones issued by the federal government or used for official purposes, I think is, the, is what it says, um, cannot have the TikTok app on the phone. Um, this has been a regulation in some places, like certain departments have had these orders at times. I think the Pentagon had one like this and that sort of thing. But now this is a blanket thing. And this is because there's more and more concern that, you know, that TikTok is owned by a Chinese company called ByteDance, which is controlled for the most part by the Chinese Communist Party. And and we've seen more and more indications that they have, despite their assurances, they actually do have access to the phones and the information on the phones. Uh, what do you think? I, I, I'll start off by saying, I've never had TikTok installed on any of my (laughs) devices and I never will. What do you think? I think that first of all, it's ridiculous. It's taken this long to have that put into place. And second of Mm -hmm. all, they should ban any non-authorized apps on any government issued phones. Like you shouldn't be able to install anything on your government issued phone. Right. Have a second phone, personal phone for yourself. Right. Right. Yeah. I I mean, like Google collects, quite a tremendous amount of data are we just saying well google's okay because they're an american company you know we can can regulate them (laughs) after the fact i don't know it's it's really bizarre yeah well and in fact in some cases i I remember that it might be the nsa was saying that um employees of the of the agency not only could they not have it on their government phone they couldn't put it on their personal phone and no one who lived in their house could have the app mm. on their personal phones. Like it couldn't be in their household, which if the NSA is saying this, 
it means maybe they know something about it, what's going on that we don't, or maybe just the potential. Um, I, I just, I look at it and then I, then I say to myself, but you know, Instagram has a TikTok like feature, the re- Instagram reels, but is Facebook any better? I guess they're not the Chinese communist government, but you know, <laughs> they're still sucking down data. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I just, I question whether it's better to have communists with, uh, with data than it is to have capitalists with data. I don't really see how, how anybody having this much data about me is Bad a good thing. Theory. Yeah. <laughs> Regardless of their economics. <laughs> right. I don't want my government to have this data for, for one thing. I mean, never mind that, that government. Um, yeah. There was another article this week about how um, it's been found that TikTok was um, hacking into the phones of uh, jur- uh, Forbes journalists that to track their location. So Forbes had some insider information about what TikTok was doing, and now they've revealed that TikTok decided to trace the locations of these journalists in real time in order to identify where they've been and whether they've been meeting with some bite dance employees, which <laughs> does not do anything to in- you make reassure us that you're not as bad as these Forbes articles was telling us you are. It's that just kind of like ironic thing that a communist party would do. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. No. <laughs> yeah. So I, I have good friends who, you know, who love TikTok. They think it has created a, a you know, great community and gives them, um, you know, access to, to people and very good information. But I just, yeah, I'll, uh, I mean, I, I, I maybe I'm a hypocrite because I use Instagram and Facebook, but, uh, you know, maybe I should just stick to Twitter. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I've, I've sworn them all off man i'm i am yeah. i'm off of all of them i i do reddit and discord discord because yeah. you know, i can control the communities i'm in and then reddit but but even those they're an, it's an app on my phone and yep. if they're collecting data they're collecting it about me so right figure. one of the things i i, I want to emphasize to people is when the apps ask you for access to your address book or contacts say no Always, invariably, mm-hmm. always say no, because when they're asking for that, what they're doing is harvesting all that information and creating webs of information. But also you're giving away other people's private information, their email addresses, maybe even their addresses and phone numbers without their permission. Like some people may not want you to give out that information. And that's what you're doing when you do that. So just it, this is any app it just occurred to me now just say no to that all the time and be suspicious mm-hmm. of apps that ask for it without any good purpose so you, it's it's sad but these days we've got to be suspicious of of all these apps they, because data is very very valuable and they want it mm-hmm. all right enough of the dystopian stuff let's talk about something cool some cool tech um <laughs> tesla i don't know we're not moving very far from dystopian here <laughs> <laughs> well, i don't know i think i want to play video games in my car so tesla has now <laughs> launched steam in its cars you can play steam the, the steam library uh on the entertainment system built into the cars and apparently these entertainment systems are so po- powerful they're powerful enough computers that they they are competitive with, you know, dedicated gaming consoles out there. Um, and I'm, I was looking at this going, but I like, is they, they obviously lock out the driver, right? I mean, this is, well, at the end of the article, it, it basically says, look, we're looking forward to the day when cars are self-driving. This sort of thing, like video games to keep you occupied while you're in commuting and to work while the cars do all the driving, that'll be in demand. I'm like, Okay. <laughs> we have learned nothing from the uh, the myriad failures of the auto driving feature in, in <laughs> Tesla. Yeah, I see. Yes. Uh, my my favorite part of this article was the uh, the graphic that comes with it for next generation consoles. Consoles and it, in quotes. You know, quotes the price. Yeah. And then one of them, the, the you know, the Tesla is seventy nine thousand nine hundred ninety for this console. Yeah. Comes with car. <laughs> it comes with the car, right? <laughs> well, then there's the KF console. I don't know if you saw that one from KFC. <laughs> yeah. It comes with a chicken chamber. I I, uh-huh. I think I remember hearing about that. It was like it's a gaming <laughs> computer 
that comes with chicken. Like it's like a it's a it's a gimmick, right? To sell chicken, fried chicken. But it has a chicken chamber inside the computer bucket. Um, it looks like a bucket. It's uh, kind of wild chicken for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no price on that one. It's, it's, you got to do something with all that heat, right? Just <laughs> <laughs> keep yeah. your chicken warm. That's not a bad idea. Washing go. it to keep it sanitary though is kind of dangerous. But uh, I need a trick. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, I don't know. I mean, it's kind of interesting. I, I mean, I've I've never been one for getting a vehicle with entertainment systems. I know some people love the idea of you know, putting a video on for the kids while you're on long rides and that sort of stuff. And, you know, nowadays kids will have their own phones or iPads anyway. Um, but um, I don't know. Like, it's kind of cool. I love it as a as a as a technology idea that you could do this sort of thing. I'm not right. sure I want it in my car, right. <laughs> but it's a cool tech idea. I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure I want it in other people's cars. That's that's my problem, really. Yeah. <laughs> what if the, the Bluetooth uh, wireless uh, game controller accidentally gets control of the of the driving feature and suddenly they're all over the road? Uh, yeah, see, what I want is I would like to have this feature, but then have it be where when you're parked, you can tie it into the control system in the car so you can play racing with your actual car <laughs> that'd be fun that'd be kind of fun grand theft auto <laughs> yep that, that's what i was thinking you know it's, it's, it's coming that's just, again that huh? might be a really bad idea but <laughs> all right so it's i mean interesting technology we'll see where that goes it's maybe a bad idea but it's interesting technology all right let's move on to our picks of the week and thomas you're up first all right. So um, I'll start off with my kind of refurbed pick of the week. Uh, so previously on the show, I recommended Dwarf Fortress. Uh, I realized that when I recommended it, it was uh, there may have been some people that went to try it out and said, this is not a video game. This is torture because it was all <laughs> assy graphics, you know, with the just little uh, little uh, commas and uh, at symbols and everything on the page. It is now out on Steam with full graphics. So if, if you tried it before and hated it because you didn't like the UI and you didn't understand what you were looking at, you can try it on Steam now. I highly recommend it. I hated it when I started playing it on Steam because it was not what I was used to. <laughs> <laughs> but I have come to love it and I have come to enjoy it and, and have dumped quite a few hours into making my forts and um, losing my dwarfs all along the way. So definitely nice. recommend it. It's a lot of fun. Uh, but then the other one I realized, like this week, my kids uh, got into the snap circuits in my house. They they found our old bin of snap circuits. It hasn't been out for a couple of years. And the younger ones were like, what are these? And so they pulled them out. And what what a snap circuit is, if you don't know, it's a a board that you can click little button uh, wires onto. So the wires have button ends and you snap them into place. And you create circuits and it comes with instruction manuals about how to create all these different circuits. Uh, my seven year old grabbed it, uh, came out with it. She built the picture that was on the front of the manual without any instructions at all. Just looked at the manual, like put put it together from what was there. And voila, she had an AM radio working mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was and it started playing an AM radio station. And she was like, this is awesome. <laughs> so now she's plowing through all the instruction manuals at this point. <laughs> yeah. I, I I recommended this years ago uh, when on one of our first Christmas gift idea shows because we have one of these and my son loves it and he periodically takes it out you know and gets obsessed with it for for a week or so and he creates all kinds of the, and he he's very methodical so he goes from, like from page one and does each one of the mm -hmm. different plants and the projects and there's dozens of them there maybe hundreds I don't know there's, there's so many and it's a it's a fun little gate, you know, a toy that teaches you about electronics. Like mm -hmm. this is what a resistor is. This is a, this is what a switch is and how it works and you know, a parallel and serial and all these other things. And yeah, it just it's it's fabulous and it's got a little heli uh, helicopter rotor that you can launch. Mm -hmm. It's got a <laughs> they love that. That's yeah. their favorite. Group. Yes, I think it's you hold down the switch and then when you let go of the switch it just flies off. And <laughs> yes. <laughs> lots of shooting those at each other around our house right now. And uh <laughs> speakers and all kinds of gadgets and gizmos and stuff. Yeah, I recommend it. Yeah, that is a good that is a good uh, pick of the week. Uh how about you Jack? What's your pick this week? My pick uh this week is a uh, BST sound library. Uh that's a virtual studio technology. Um, you can use it. It's basically what you use for MIDI. Um, the BBC Symp Symphony Orchestra um, has a free uh, VST library with a bunch of different orchestral sounds. Um, 
you can put it into any uh, digital audio workstation and use it to write orchestral music. Uh, it's really cool, and the nice thing about it is that it's free. Um, so it's free if you want to wait two weeks. If, if you sign up for the account, it, they'll let you have it in two weeks, or you can pay fifty dollars and get it right then. Um, I mean, it's it's worth it's worth waiting for, uh, but it's it's a lot of fun. It's completely free, and it works with. Uh, like Logic Pro or Reaper or any of those programs. Um, and it sounds really nice too because it's sampled from real instruments. Wow. So beautiful music and teaches you the virtue of patience. Exactly. <laughs> delayed, <laughs> delayed gratification. <laughs> right. <laughs> that is great. I, I, I wish I was a music, you know, musician and musical to could use this sort of thing because I love this idea of having access to all of these, you know, amazing instruments or whatever. Um, yeah. In fact, I, th- I see on the website, you can even use it in GarageBand, which every Mac has on it. So, right. Like, yeah. You know, teach, have your kids teach themselves how to make music. <laughs> That's beautiful. That's awesome. Good pick. So my pick is a neat little gadget I picked up a while ago. And if you have a laptop computer and you're used to working at a desktop with a lot of de- monitor space, especially like if you're someone like me who has two monitors, uh, going down to a laptop, like if you're on a trip or whatever, can be really confining and make it hard to even get your work done. There are things you can do, like you have, a, if you have an iPad, you could do the new that new fancy thing where you can slide off from the you know the control of the iPad as a secondary monitor. But you could also, uh, much less expensively, buy a second monitor, a travel monitor. Uh, so. And there's dozens of them out there. I'll just mention the one that I happen to pick up, which is uh, called the KPQ Portable Monitor. It's a 15-inch monitor, and it connects via mini HDMI or USB-C. It's a USB-C cable that goes into the Display Port on the uh, you know on the uh, MacBook, my MacBook, and you, you can use it for PC. Mac, phone, even it says Xbox and PS4, which is fun. So if you if you take taking those on a trip or something like that, and it works fine. It's a 1080p, you know, screen. So it's not highest resolution, but it's a pretty decent resolution. And you know, I I'm out on a trip or I'm out working outside the home. I can set it up, put it next to it, my my computer, and it connects. It's powered off of um, the computer. There are ones where you can power off of the uh, you know a separate power supply, but this is really convenient. So it has two cables. One is the power, and one is the video signal. So you have to have a uh, two ports free on the computer itself. So uh, if you have a MacBook, those are your two ports. <laughs> so yeah, unless so you might want to get one of those uh, hub dongle thingies to, to yeah. give you extra ports. <laughs> So because you need power. I was say mine only has one. I, I would be I would be dead in the water. <laughs> right, right. So um yeah, it's so it's it's not much more complicated than that. I mean it's it really it works, it shows up, it looks like a second display on the uh on the computer in the in the settings and it, it just works just like that. So um just uh I recommend it if you ever have a need for something like that. And this one is 160 bucks, which is not bad for a monitor. Yeah. yeah. Nice. That's not bad at all. Yeah. It's actually really, I saw this and I was like, yes, this add to cart. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I've been looking for exactly this kind of thing. That'd so. be nice. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's been, it's come in handy a few times uh, in the past, especially when I had to uh, work out of the home for various things um, and just to get things done. I've, I've gotten too used to having two monitors. I need to have a second monitor when I'm working. All right, so that does it for this time. We would love to hear what you think of anything we talked about today. You can let us know by commenting on the show at sqpn.com slash technology or the SQPN Facebook page, facebook.com slash Media. Send an email to technology at sqpn.com or join the conversation at our Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord. And you'll find links from our discussion and our picks of the week in our show notes at sqpn.com. And remember to like the episodes that you find of Secrets of Technology, wherever you find them, on Facebook, Twitter, where we're at SQPN, and so on. We'd like to thank James for his research assistance in this episode. And until next time, Jack Barazzini, thank you for joining me and sharing the Secrets of Technology. Thanks, Tom. And Thomas Sonerho, thank you as well. It's been a pleasure. 
And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to The Secrets of Technology on StarQuest. Hi, everyone. This is Dom Bettinelli, CEO of StarQuest, with a special message. This past year, the StarQuest Network has continued to expand our mission of exploring the intersection of faith and pop culture through our many entertaining and informative programs. Now we need your generous financial support to keep producing the shows you love and to reach new audiences with more of the life-changing and uplifting programming we've been creating for more than a decade. That's why it's very important that we hear from you this Advent and Christmas, the time when nonprofits receive most of their support for the year. If you are already a supporter of StarQuest, we thank you and ask you to prayerfully consider increasing your support at this time. If you're not yet a supporter, please become one now. Every gift counts. Could you give $15 or even just $10 per month? Whatever level of support you can offer, please show your support for SQP on this Christmas. And remember that your gifts are tax deductible. Just go to sqpn.com slash give. That's sqpn.com slash give. And may you have a blessed Christmas season.